Hey guys, it's Key Bros. So today we're very honored to have a very well-known author and journalist with us. Hi there. And he is Mr. Nuri Vitarchi. And thank you very much for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, do you mind briefly introducing yourself to our audience, like what you do and the type of work you normally like uh, conduct? Right. I mean, I'm really, uh, if I was honest, I'd say I was a typist. Right. Because all my best material comes from, uh, comes from readers. I get uh, uh, sometimes a thousand messages, comments, notes, emails in a day, from mostly from Hong Kong people. Yeah. And so I type them in. So, so it's teamwork. The, uh, the Hong Kong public does all the work and I get paid. That's the kind of teamwork I like. Wonderful. So recently we know that you've published your new book and shameless plug here, The Other Side of the Story by yes. none other than the uh, Mr. <laughs> Nuri Fitachi. So could you tell us a few things about your new book? What's it about? The content, how it came to be, so that's right. it. But basically, as, the, as, as you can see in this backwards print, can you read that? The other side of the story, Secret War in Hong Kong. So the, the story of the Hong Kong disturbances in 2019, that was literally the most reported story in the global media of that year, yep. uh, by far. <clears throat> and yet, every salient detail of that story was wrong. Um, it was misreported at uh, every key stage. And uh, I think Hong Kong people on the ground could see this and could see the real story. And so I got thousands of letters telling me the real story and saying, look, someone's got to say this. And um, I had some advantages in being that, uh, you know, my, my superpower is not shutting up. And uh, a lot of these things were difficult to say and difficult to put your name to. Uh, so I just said, okay, Hong Kong people, write to me, I'll get it in print, uh, and we'll tell the true story. And so out of that came a series of news columns, magazine articles, and websites, and eventually this book. Okay, so how has the reception of your book been so far? Like, have you ever received an abuse like, from people who disagree with you? <laughs> right. Uh, uh, yes, of course, but uh, um, I I'm so used to that now, you know. Uh, Abuse from certain people is a badge of honour. Mm. So uh, yeah, we definitely concur with that. Yeah, right. agree. <laughs> so, and in fact, if uh, if you write something and nobody gets annoyed, it's kind of I feel kind of disappointed now. Mm -hmm. I think, oh, yeah, I'm not doing my job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? I mean, to some to some extent, you can see journalism as um, uh, a journalistic article is a bit of news you reveal that probably will annoy somebody somewhere. Right. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. That's just the way it works, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to tell the truth without offending someone. Yeah, otherwise, what are you doing? It's just PR, isn't it? Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm rude to everybody here. I'm rude to the Chinese government. I'm rude to the, go the Hong Kong government. I'm rude to the Western governments. I'm rude to my industry. Um, you know, so we all made terrible mistakes during that yeah. year, mm -hmm. and uh, we should be called out for it. That's right. In the book, you've actually mentioned about some sort of US and like Western interference in Hong Kong. And do you have any concrete proof of that in your book? Like... Right. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, very. I was very much uh, on the protesters side. I've been marching with the protesters every year for 30 years, ever since the first great protest, which was long before you were born. Yeah. I know Indeed. I sound like a very old person here, but uh, yeah, way back in 1989, May the 21st, that was the first big protest in Hong Kong. And every year we've had protests and I was there with my banner and with my kids, I made them all come along. Uh, and I got started to get uncomfortable uh, because I'd heard so much about rumors of uh, US uh, involvement. Uh, for me, one of the culminations was in the middle of summer this uh, during the Hong Kong protests of 2019, when uh, they handed out all these banners saying, defend our constitution. Mm -hmm. And me and the other Hong Kong people, we just looked at those. We just said, we don't have a constitution. Uh, a, this was written by someone who, uh, who doesn't understand Hong Kong, and B, who hasn't done any research, yeah. not even mm -hmm. the basic True. bit of research. But, and of course, the, um, the please send troops, Donald Trump, you know, I, I just realized, you know, I mean, I, many Hong Kong people said to me, we don't say things like that. Nobody, 
we're too intelligent to call for Donald Trump to come and solve our problems. In fact, probably everybody in the world is too intelligent to think Donald Trump come and solve our problems would be a smart thing to say. I suspect even Donald Trump's own family would realize that's not a smart thing to say. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting because you speaking of defending our constitution reminds me of something that the uh, UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has said. Um, so basically, he gave a speech, I think, after the enactment of the national security law. Yeah. And he said, well, this is a blatant breach of China's basic law. That definitely reflects how the Western politicians in the Western media basically understand nothing about Hong Kong, but they make these ludicrous statements, which are wildly inaccurate, but still, they make it. So, so speaking of, you know, going against this Western narrative, so apparently you were once banned from Facebook for making posts. So could you tell us a few things <laughs> right. about that story? Uh, yes. So um, um, my wonderful sources, the Hong Kong people, uh, came to me one day, some of them, and said um, that we're very uncomfortable by the fact that there's one Hong Kong person that's quoted in all the international media again and again, and he's the main voice for one of the most uh, anti-government websites, uh, a website called the Hong Kong Free Press, mm -hmm. right. and um, he's a Guai Lo, okay. <laughs> and uh, they were uncomfortable about this because he was using a Hong Kong name. He was, he'd actually written that he was born in Hong Kong and went to a local government school here. Um, um, anyway, so I said, you're right, this is just feels wrong. Yeah. So uh, I, I put uh, the news onto uh, into the newspaper and uh, onto the internet and um, I majorly got uh, legal threats from the, the main website that was publishing his stuff and also um, got banned from Facebook. Uh, obviously there's some connections uh, there, they must have complained in some way. Um, but um, the, the editor of the newspaper uh, had printed it uh, I printed this news in, said, we're not going to withdraw this story. This story is true. Mm. It's, uh, it's just simple, factual and relevant. And so we kept the story up there. And eventually people realised it was true. And that gentleman in question uh, left Hong Kong right. um, when uh, the, national, the new security law came in. And I know we talked about like you have attended mm -hmm. a lot of mm -hmm. protests before, right? And I remember what you were also like once quite renowned for being an ardent critic of Beijing, all right? Mm -hmm. And you also made fun of like pro establishment people in the past. Mm -hmm. However, people have also criticized you for like being so called Beijing's puppet recently, mm -hmm. like a Wu Mao, you know? So, and do you consider yourself still as like a long term protester? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, I can honestly say I've never voted for anybody except the opposition uh, in Hong Kong. So I'm very much a sort of yellow camp type person. And, um, you know, one of the things I was annoyed about, I mean, most of my sources are, are yellow camp and protesters, but um, one of the things I was really annoyed about, or we were all annoyed about, was the umbrellas. Mm. Like the umbrellas, um, we felt they were a very positive thing. They were, um, they were, represented ordinary people and they were not weapons, they were just, you know, items of shelter, positive things. And then in 2019, the new group of uh, violent radicals repurposed the umbrellas. And wherever we went, suddenly we'd see these black or grey umbrellas suddenly opened up. And we always knew that whenever that was happening, a crime was being committed. So someone was being beaten up, uh, something was being damaged, a shop was being burned, um, something awful was happening. And so the reporters, we all came to hate umbrellas. Right. There was one particularly funny incident where um, all the umbrellas opened up. And so we all took our cameras out saying, OK, this is good. And they set light to a Chinese flag. So, um, you know, uh, even though I don't approve of burning anybody's flag, but well, this is a good news angle, isn't it? Mm. But it wouldn't light because because uh, uh, the Hong Kong government has mandatory rules saying that flags must be made out of non-flammable materials, right? So they yeah. couldn't light it. Yeah. And then suddenly uh, they got frustrated and uh, all the umbrellas came down yeah. again. And they discussed, what do we do with this? We yeah. can't light it. And then the umbrellas went up again 
and they stomped on it and tore it and threw it in the harbour, you know. Uh, and from then on, the policy was, don't try and burn them, just stomp on them and throw them in the harbour. Oh, wow, interesting. Yeah. So speaking of, you know, being a long-term protester yourself and being an ardent critic of the pro-establishment camp, so what made you change your mind on the protest last year? Uh, what kind of, was, it, was there sort of a light bulb moment where you went, oh, this is definitely, there's something wrong going on with this protest? Well, could you share a few thoughts about that? Uh, yes, I mean, um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, I want to emphasize it's not, it's not just, it's not just me who had this revelation, but if you actually look at the, the numbers, whether it's the, the claimed numbers by the organizers or the numbers by the crowd scientists, there were hundreds of thousands of people yeah. marching in June. Uh, I was among them. And um, by a month or two later, 99% had stopped. We're not into violence. Hong Kong people are not violent people. Hong Kong people are peaceful people. This is one of the most peaceful societies in the world. Um, so that violent radicalism is not natural for here. And, and, and the, the weapons too. I mean, like, I brought along these items. These are, these are the, the ground in Chim Sa Choi was littered with thousands of these, uh, these spikes. Uh, this particularly sharp and nasty looking one went right through my shoe into my foot. Oh, wow. mm. um, uh, these went into the feet of passers-by, into car wheels, into police dogs' feet, you know. Uh, and um, this type of violent weapon, this is not natural to Hong Kong young people. Mm, Hong yeah. Kong young people are great. They're peaceful, intelligent, and they they do their homework. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> I do quite a lot of teaching as a, as a part-time job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love Hong Kong young people. I have so much respect for them. So this comes from outside. I'm absolutely sure of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting because I talk to numerous university friends um, here in Hong Kong who are locals, obviously. And I think most of them, even if they're part of the so-called yellow camp, they tend to disagree with the violent radicals, yeah. especially mm -hmm. after that's the fun. events. Um, that transpired last last year after they attacked Let's Go. Mm. I think that definitely turned a lot of people off. But still, in the uh, Western media or even in the Hong Kong media, mm. they still dominate the narrative, the violent oh, radicals. Yeah. So mm. there's definitely a bias there because I think it's quite obvious that even the Hong Kong media itself mm. doesn't properly reflect the um, prevailing opinions mm. of Hong Kong young people. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a very important point, is that um, the, the media in general, certainly the international media, and to some extent the local media, haven't dug deep. Mm -hmm. They haven't dug even one centimetre below the surface to see what's really going on. I mean, just to give an example, the, the, the media said that any allegations that there was foreign interference were fake. Uh, the New York Times said it's a shock-worn canard from Beijing. Uh, canard means like a sort of glib chestnut statement um, but then it turned out there was financial help there was uh, and then they said well there's 642,000 from the NED but that's just a small sum but Hong Kong people told me no it's more than that there's millions and then eventually there was a leaked email which showed it was millions mm. uh, of dollars so you know the truth comes out but the truth did not come from the journalists it came from Hong Kong people, mm. and that's really important. That uh, and 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 journalists, we need to do a better job. We're not doing a great job. Um, the ordinary people of Hong Kong are doing a much better job. They're doing our job for us, and that's and that's wrong. We need to we need to step up, guys. Do our job. Yeah, yeah definitely. I remember actually we had a look at like the NED website and. Uh, it was quite a large sum, but we also knew that it was not the only sum. There has to be like more sources from there. In fact, it, the NED contribution was one of the smallest yeah, contributions. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, yes yeah. exactly. And uh, we want to touch on like the bigger picture now, which is like the US-China conflict. Mm -hmm. Touch on like the NED and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you have made a lot of like satires and like cartoons like on your pit, pit posts, <laughs> which we really like actually. And um, you've highlighted a lot of like hypocrisy, double standard stuff the Western world has adopted towards Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Can you name a, like a few like funny ones, just like <laughs> yeah. uh, for a joke? <laughs> yes, I mean there's, there's there's lots of them. Like 
Well, for example, the um, the national security law. Yeah. Um, the, the the national security laws of Hong Kong are actually among the mildest. Mm -hmm. um, like the U.S. national security laws are so scary. Yeah. They are so scary. They can basically do anything they like, including assassinate their own citizens. Mm. That's covered by the U.S. national security laws. Uh, the U.S. has like 20 layers of uh, separate laws in their national security law package. I, th I think journalists tend to be on the side of protesters. They see them as the underdog. But I think if they realize that the world's richest com country is actually behind the protests, stirring up trouble, stirring up hate, financing them. I mean, one of the things that the, uh, the US financed in Hong Kong was uh, um, they had a whole fund just for uh, enabling uh, protesters to evade the police, right. to evade the law. Right. Now, can you just imagine if China um, had a whole department uh, helping people in the US evade the law yeah. in a political situation? There would be hell to pay. Yeah. Um, the UK national security law is also really uh, stringent. Yeah. Um, 600 people a month are stopped at the UK borders to uh, under the Terrorist Act 2000. That's just one of their security laws. And of those, 174 per month are arrested or detained or charged. You know, how many people are stopped at Hong Kong's borders under Hong Kong's national security laws? Zero. Zero this month, zero last month, zero the month before, zero the month before. Um, so there's just no comparison between Hong Kong's security law and uh, the ones in the West. And yet, just try and find one article which says that. They don't. Mm. They all imply that Hong Kong's is the worst. They use the word draconian again and again and again. Yeah. Uh, I don't think journal journalists even know what the word draconian means. Draconian is named after a guy called Draco, who said that um, the law works better if it is strict and let's make the penalty for stealing a vegetable death. And people who stole a vegetable will be put to death. That's what draconian means, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, no, it doesn't happen in Hong Kong. Yeah, that's very interesting because as law students ourselves, we've, because we have an avid interest in human rights law, we've come across many interesting cases in UK law itself, yeah. which none of the uh, journalists in Hong Kong or in the Western media like to report upon. Um, for example, I think I remember there was this case where, um, the, uh, where MI5 yeah. and the CIA kidnapped the family, I think the 12-year-old daughter and a 5-year-old son or something yeah. of a Libyan dissident from Hong Kong packaged them on a plane, sent them to Libya, to Gaddafi, for him to torture because they were trying to do some sort of, you know, under the table deal. Mm -hmm. That's so much worse than anything that a Hong Kong government is even, you know, capable of. But, you know, again, the Hong Kong people think that the UK or the US is some sort of paradise where we can enjoy immense liberty and freedom there. Yeah. So they definitely have to do some digging. And also, I think you, you are very right, the Hong Kong media has to step up. Mm -hmm. and do some digging. I think there's another thing in um, UK Human Rights Law which is um, called the uh, ABSO, the anti- yeah, yeah. Oh, ASBO, sorry, um, the Anti-Social Behavior Order, which is basically an order that can be issued by the government. So basically, um, they can do something like they'll see someone on the streets, probably Islamic or, you know, of Asian origin, and then they'll be like, oh, you seem a bit dodgy. So here's an order, stay home. You can only meet certain people um, you know, upon governmental approval. You can only come out during certain hours. You have to be home by 8 p.m. or something. You can only shop at certain supermarkets, but there's no right to appeal. Mm -hmm. And that's indefinite. So that's so much, so much worse than yeah, what Hong definitely. Kong people can be subjected to yeah. under the national security law. And that's in the UK. Mm -hmm. So, you know. And also there's like Bonsdam Bay. In right, the US, exactly, right? exactly. It's noted. I think one thing about the uh, Hong Kong national security law and also the Hong Kong judicial system in general, I think we have a very transparent system yeah. compared to the US or the UK, where first of all, the materials or the laws themselves, they are so complicated and they're so you know um, broad stroke that mm -hmm. most typical citizens don't really have an idea of what that law is about, what mm -hmm. that law entails. 
for example, the Patriot Act, mm -hmm. where it says something like, you cannot aid the enemy of the United States or something mm -hmm. like that. So how do you define the enemy <laughs> yeah. of the United States? So I guess I am an enemy of the United States. So you can't Donald Trump me. is probably the worst right, enemy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So right. if you vote for Trump, <laughs> you can be um, sent to Guantanamo Bay. And exactly like things like Guantanamo Bay or sort of these documents that, you know, the CIA declassifies after 30, 40 years. And you see what's going on, for example, the uh, Token Bay incident, which was the U.S. excuse for intervening in Vietnam. That was totally staged by CIA. But for 40, 50 years, people are just like, oh, it's definitely a conspiracy theory. <laughs> definitely didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of Hong Kong people, even though they like to say, especially people from the Yellow Cap, not to generalize, but they like to say that the Blue Camp people are unintelligent or they don't do digging or they blindly believe in conspiracy theories. But, and then they'll say stuff like, oh, the NED definitely had no no influence in Hong Kong. So I think that's, to me, that's quite amusing. And But I, I think in a way you can't exactly blame them, but you because you can't expect, you know, your typical layman to do so much digging into these facts. So it's really up to the journalists to figure these things out. But unfortunately, the Hong Kong media has been quite lacking in that regard. Uh, and the other thing that really annoyed me was like, I was on the street with my camera, this happened so many times, and the the radical violent protesters would be saying, okay, stop filming. They're gonna start doing something yep. illegal. Mm. And then half the journalists would stop filming or would turn to focus on the police. And of course, I just kept filming what was really going on. And then they would surround me yeah. and um, demand that I delete my, my pictures and they would stand and watch and make me delete my pictures. Um, and that happened several times, not just to me, to, to several other reporters. Um, but that just wasn't reported, you know. It was like, that was the attack on the free press. Yeah. The attack on the exactly. free press was not from the government, it was from the protesters. Yeah, definitely. I think some of the stuff that they've done, even though they say that they are fighting for democracy, is actually anti-democracy in like, okay. itself, because democracy, as we've said all along, entails like, different opinions being expressed mm. and peacefully like not mm. by coercing someone yeah. like journalists into deleting their footage for example so yeah and what are the biggest misconceptions do you think when it comes to like city of journalists mm. of the western world mm. in regards to hong kong i mean the the, the single biggest problem is the um is the misrepresentation of the opinions of the Hong Kong people. Right. Like I have seen so many reports which say the Hong Kong people are standing against China, the yeah. Hong Kong people are standing against Beijing, and all the big media do it. And it's just it's just wrong. Mm. Hong Kong people have a wide range of opinions. And I've been following politics for 30 years here. So roughly one in four are on the support the anti-China parties. Yeah, yeah. About one in four people support the pro-China parties. Yeah. And two out of four are apolitical. They don't mm. vote. Mm. Okay, so basically what the Western media did is they took that one in four adults and they pretended that the one in four represented the whole of Hong Kong. Mm. And by doing that, they ignored three quarters of Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, and that was a huge misrepresentation. Um, and the, the effect, of course, was terrible because the, uh, the three out of four of us lost their voices. Mm. Three out of four Hong Kong people lost their voices. And a really mean trick that many of the reporters did is they'd, re they'd interview one in four Hong Kong people, the ones who are anti-China, and then for a balancing quote, they just put in a Beijing official. Right, mm. yeah, yeah. So then it looks like Beijing versus Hong Kong. Right, and right. it wasn't that at all. So speaking of the Western media and the Western world, are there certain parallels that you can draw between what has happened in Hong Kong or, for example, what has been happening in Thailand in recent yeah, months? Yeah, right. Yeah, so um, the, there's, a, there's a group of, uh, we call them the professional revolution consultants, right? right. They, um, uh, they're, they're, they're getting to be well known, although they like to, to stay hidden. There's one called the uh, Oslo Freedom Foundation, right. which right. sounds like it should be in Oslo, right? Uh, head office is actually in America. Uh, there's the um, uh, there's the uh, AEI Albert Einstein Institute, which sounds like it should be about science, but no, it's a consultancy 
uh, dealing in street protests. Mm. Um, and there's a group called Canvas, nonviolent protests, um, uh, based uh, out of Serbia. So these three organizations are professional revolution consultants, mm. and we know they've been working with the Hong Kong radicals. Um, why? Because they told us. Mm. They, they told journalists uh, up front, um, way back in 2013, 2014, that this is what they were doing. And then they kind of went quiet because, of course, it looked bad. But um, there's, it's just so obvious that a lot of their techniques are used. One of their techniques, for example, is to um, call for the defunding of the police, right. uh, is to imply that all the educational establishments are behind the protests. Uh, and there are various... Uh, rules that they give to protesters to topple the governments and uh, in fact they boast that they've actually toppled half a dozen governments uh, using these techniques right. mm. and they were hoping to do the same here and they failed they failed yeah actually i remember back in 2013 i actually seen a video of the, exactly the oslo freedom foundation they were conducting like um extensive training courses right. and some of the activists from hong kong were there in Oslo and um, being trained by these people. So there is definitely something I completely agree with you. Yes, and then they went quiet because they thought, yes. okay, this looks bad. So the same thing continued, the links continued, but they all went deep mm. undercover, mm. Uh, or at least deep enough for the journalists not to dig it up, which means two centimeters. Yes, <laughs> that's right. So what kind of advice will you give to like Hong Kong people now, given that it sort of died down, obviously, the violence, violent mm -hmm. calls. I don't know if they'll come back again, hopefully not. Mm -hmm. But looking forward, there's like the new national security law. It's very different from what it is like a year ago. So what mm -hmm. advice would you give for mm -hmm. people here? Uh, I, I just call on Hong Kong people to, to be themselves, to be their, their peaceful, basically apolitical, um, good-hearted, hard-working selves. Um, don't listen to people trying to stir up trouble from any side. Yeah. Don't be uh, don't be foolish, naive about Beijing. I mean, like we know the dangers there. Don't be don't be yeah. naive about them. I don't think Hong Kong people are naive about the dangers from China. But also, don't be fooled by by America. Don't be tricked into thinking that everything bad that happens comes from uh, from China. So um, uh, Hong Kong people are actually really impressed me, especially Hong Kong young people. Uh, the way they left the protests so rapidly um, when they turned violent. Um, so Hong Kong people uh, turn this back into what it is, which is uh, one of the most peaceful, intelligent, hardworking cities on the planet. You know, what a great thing to achieve. And uh, uh, let's get back to that situation. Mm -hmm. I think one interesting question that I'd like to ask you, because maybe slightly different from the people we've interviewed in the past, you mm. seem to be quite critical of both the mainland government and the Hong Kong um, pro-establishment camp. So what are your most significant, you know, disagreements with them? Oh, yes. I mean, like the Hong Kong government and the Chinese government, they're utterly useless at presenting any kind of decent argument. Mm. Uh, they have no PR skills, no yeah. marketing skills. Uh, they're just uh, uh, inarticulate and really annoying. Mm. Like, for example, we've all seen occasions where either the Chinese government or the Hong Kong government have said, um, look, what's being reported is not true. Uh, in fact, there's foreign interference here. But the trouble is that the, the Hong Kong government and the Chinese government, they say this in such a robotic way but it sounds like they're lying. Mm. Mm. So they just make the situation mm. worse. Yeah. You know, so honestly, it's just like, I think a lot of people feel like this, that um, the, uh, they need to step up that side. Uh, on the other hand, I do realize that whatever the Hong Kong government says, it gets um, twisted. So you've got to feel a bit sorry for them. You know, they're, they're obviously nervous about saying anything. Yeah. You know? So uh, I've got a lot of good friends in the civil service. And they've had a tough time, but they've kept doing their jobs. And Hong Kong is emerging out of this right, dark time. Right. So speaking of the civil service or, you know, Hong Kong going forward in a more positive direction, 
What sort of reforms do you think、um, do we need to make in regard to, for example, our civil service or our governmental system or indeed our electoral system? Yeah,、um, it's tricky. I mean, the、um, uh, you know the night after the the damage to Ledgeco, there was an old man standing outside、right. uh, the morning after. Did you see that interview?、Uh, he gave an interview、uh, to a TV、uh, company, and he said that. These people trying to fight for democracy have actually put democracy back、yeah. for 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 generations. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think now we can't introduce democracy in the way that we tried to do in 2013.、Um, but at the same time, it's very interesting, and in that people have gone off democracy in the West. You see, so many books saying Western liberal democracy doesn't、mm. work universally.、Um, A, pre, a prerequisite for Western democracy is to have a, a, a strong economy, and、um, we've seen that in the West, and we need that in China as well. So、um, uh, I don't think we're going to get dem- democratically elected le- legislature now. It's、mm. uh, the, the the violent radicals have made that impossible.、Mm. Right. So, do you think that's part of the Western, you know? I don't know intelligence agencies or Western governments plan to kind of have this democratic back backsliding in Hong Kong. Do you think they actually want less democracy? Yes, they do. They wanted specifically to destroy one country, two systems. Right. Why? Because by t- by around two thousand nine, two thousand ten, it was obvious it was working really well. Yeah. It actually was working well, and so they set out to destroy that. And so many of the things that they asked the protesters to do, carry the U.S. flags,、mm. call for U.S. troops to come、yeah. in, they were specifically targeted to force Beijing to send in the PLA.、Mm. And what、uh, shocked everybody, including me, is Beijing's patience. I mean, like, who knew that Beijing would be so patient and wouldn't send in the PLA?、Yeah. I mean, I got so many.、Uh, Uh, emails, Twitter、uh, notifications saying the tanks were arriving,、uh, the the PLA is arriving in Hong Kong. Of course, it never happened. Beijing was just really patient. So the 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 attempt to kill one country two systems failed in 2019. Now, when the new security law came in in 2020, the Western The Five Eyes decided, okay, let's use that,、mm. and they've used that to say, look, one country, two systems is completely dead because of the Issue Creed Law. But it isn't. Hong Kong people know it isn't. Hong Kong people can see. Hong Kong people can go out and pick up a copy of Apple Daily,、yeah. and it's just as bullshy as ever. Yeah. 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 So it's just obvious、Definitely. that it hasn't. But the Western media, unfortunately, is not telling people this.、Mm. On a final note, then.、Um, You having spoken about the one country two systems framework, do you think it's a sustainable framework for the future? Because our position has always been that we would like to see, you know, one country two systems go forward beyond 2047. Although, you know, against the traditional mainstream narrative, there is no specific end date、yeah. to one country two systems. That's right.、Um, it's just that it's not going to change for 50 years. Doesn't mean it won't continue after 2047. But I think one thing that the radicals in Hong Kong are doing is that by dismantling, you know, the one country principle, they are basically tearing apart the whole framework and saying, "Oh,、yeah. we want to go in a wholly separate direction." And I think that's actually detrimental to, you know, Hong Kong people being able to preserve their freedoms. And as you've rightly said, what they what they've actually achieved in doing is prevent Hong Kong people from having genuine democracy.、Yeah. And I think again, that's a complicated issue because, and we disagree on this. And in fact, because personally, I don't think Western liberal democracies、um, embody universal values. I personally don't believe in the、um, in the word universal because I think you know the West and the East have vastly different cultures, and there's no inherent need for us to adopt a Eurocentric、um, perspective on on how to govern ourselves. But again, that's a complicated topic for another day. So, but anyway, going back to my question, how do you see one country, two systems go forward? And What advice would you give to Hong Kong people? Do you think we should compromise more with Beijing, or do you think they're right in thinking that Beijing is trying to impose itself upon Hong Kong?、Mm-hmm. That's a very good point. Very good question.、Uh, and in fact, I can answer it with with two very simple points.、Uh, number one, this is a transition period. What do you do during a transition period? 
you transit. Yeah. So so yes, don't fight the transition. Right. Uh, uh, flow with it. And secondly, your point about it continuing after 2047 is so important. That's so important and missed by almost everybody. So I'm so happy to hear you say it. In fact, if you go into the civil service, uh, like especially the lands and housing department, and spy in their filing cabinets, this is what you'll find. You'll find numerous um, deals, property licenses, uh, land leases that go right past 2047. Mm -hmm. They go to 2060, they go to 2065, they go to 2070. In fact, what's actually going to happen in 2047 in Hong Kong is nothing. There'll be no change yeah. because it will just sail past. The 50 years is a minimum period, not a maximum exactly. period. Yeah. And there'll actually be no change. It'll be a peaceful transition in 2047. Unless uh, the professional um, revolution consultants come in and try and stir it up. But this time, we know about you professional revolution consultants. We're watching you and we're going to be ready for you next time. So there. Great. So thank you very much again to Mr. Uh, Mr. Katashi for coming on to our show. And please stay tuned for our next few episodes. And we hope that you enjoyed this episode. Please give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to our channel by press the red button below. All right. See you in the next one. Bye.